Hey friends, it's Laurie with the blog WagonWheelHomestead.com. We grow in zone four here in Nebraska and it is a cold snowy day in late February and I love to take a day like this in the winter to plan out my garden. So I wanted to take you along as I do that and I want to also show you a really cool online tool that's really inexpensive that I have used for many years to help me know exactly when I need to start my seeds, how many I should plant, and it also helps me know how to care for my garden. So what I wanna show you first is I always purchase these planners from Jill Winger at the Prairie Homestead. And these are the old fashioned on purpose planners. I've gotten them for several years. This one is for 2022. This one was for 2023 and this one is for 2024. And the fun part about that is it's a blank slate. What I love about these planners is that in the back they have an area where you can draw out your garden and also different pages where you can keep track of your seeds and when to plant and all those things. What I like about putting it in a planner is that if I wrote it on a piece of paper, it would be lost by the time the year was over. So I'm gonna look back at what I did for 2022 and 2023. And I'm also going to refer to the charts that Jill puts in here on companion planting and crop rotation because it will help me really quickly and easily without looking up a lot of different resources, figure out where I should plant certain things in my garden this year based on where I had them last year. Or in other words, how I want to rotate my crops to help prevent disease and pests and just to have a really good, healthy garden. So what I'm gonna do is just take you along with me. What I did Earlier this year is I took a nice sunny day and I sat down outside and I inventoried all of my seeds. So I have a list in here of all the seeds that I currently have and I need to get the garden planned out and figure out what seeds I need to purchase and get them ordered so that I can start my seeds in March and some of them in April. So here's my list of seeds. If my planner looks a little rough to you, it's because I spilled stuff on it liquid stuff on it right after getting it, but it's okay, I'll just have to live with it for the year. So, all right, so I'm gonna look back at where I planted everything last year in my planner. And I don't draw this out exactly to scale. Uh, so my garden is 70 feet wide and 100 feet long. That includes some blueberries that grow on one side, some raspberries that grow on another. It also includes a semi-permanent strawberry bed area. So I know just from past years and from measuring it out that I can grow 16 beds wide in that garden space. So here's how I like to set up my garden. You can do it many different ways. There's a lot of right ways to set up your garden but this is what I like to do and I'll tell you why. I like to grow on 30 inch wide beds. If you grow in a row, you end up with a lot of pathway space. For example, you might have an 18 inch wide pathway for you to walk and then you might put one row of carrots and another 18 inch wide pathway and another row of carrots. Like when I say row, I just mean one single row. Okay, that ends up with a lot of wasted space and it's a lot of all those 18 inch pathways that you have to keep weeded. It's really hard to manage. So I wanna keep my pathways to a minimum and I wanna keep my growing area to a maximum. So what I do is I grow on 30 inch wide beds. A lot of farmers do that. One reason is because if your bed is 50 foot long and you have a 30 inch wide bed, you can easily figure out how many square feet that is and you know exactly how much seed you will need to seed it. So it makes the math really easy. The second reason is if you have a 30 inch wide bed and you put a pathway on each side of it, you can easily reach to the inside of 30 inches to harvest. It also gives plenty of room for single row crops like cabbage, for example. 
If you plant a single row of cabbage in the middle of a 30 inch wide bed, it gives plenty of room for those cabbages to spread out. There's many more reasons that I could mention, but for now, I'm just gonna tell you that I like to grow on 30 inch wide beds and I would highly recommend that you do so as well. I use garden fabric in my garden and I will link to that down below. I use garden fabric to, with holes burnt in it and I'll show you that later on, but just know that that's how I do it to help prevent weeds. I'm a homeschooling mom of five. We grow all of our own food, but I cannot spend all day every day weeding in the garden as much as I would like to do so. I love to weed, but I have to, my garden has to be able to grow without me babysitting it every single day. Especially when we get into harvest season, we are so busy harvesting, I literally cannot weed all the pathways and all the things. So I choose to use a garden fabric and what I like to do is I have 30 inch wide beds and then 18 inch walkways. You can do 12 inch walkways, but it's a lot harder when you're walking up and down with big crates of produce, you know, when things grow a little closer to the edge than you plan and you end up with like a five inch little spot to walk. I like to use an 18 inch wide pathway. Besides my kids are running all over the garden all the time and an 18 inch wide pathway just gives a little more room. So hopefully not as much produce gets walked on. The nice thing about that is 30 inches plus 18 inches is 48 inches, which is four feet, okay? So I can order my garden fabric four feet wide. So what I do is I put a four feet wide piece of fabric over each 30 inch wide bed, and that leaves nine inches. I, I just center it, okay? And I leave nine inches in one pathway and nine inches in the other, and then the next piece of fabric from the next bed comes in nine inches into the pathway. So I'm stapling the fabric down where I walk, and it just keeps it nice and tidy. Uh, it's, it's been by far the easiest way for me to garden. The great thing about the garden fabric that I use is that it lasts eight to 10 years. So it is a bit of an investment up front, but it's something that we use long-term. I do use some cheaper fabric out in my pumpkin patch that at the end of the year I just rip up and burn, but um, that is because it covers such a huge area and it just seems to work out better to use the cheaper fabric out there. But for right now, we're just gonna talk about our main garden. By the way, I do grow my pumpkins, squash, and potatoes out in the field. That's what I was just referring to. But in my main garden here, inside my deer fence, these are the things that I grow, the things that are most susceptible to deer and pests and those other kinds of things. All right, so let's get to it. So I know that I can grow 16 rows, 16 beds wide in my garden. So what I did last year is I just blocked off 16 spots on this little grid, 16 wide, and I know that each row here is one bed. Okay, that's just easy for me. I don't make it as long as it actually is because it doesn't really matter. Uh, I just make sure that I have my width correct. So my garden is 100 feet long approximately. We grow in about 80 feet of it. The last little bit is just sod. So we grow actually in about 70 feet by 80 feet. So I know that on the north end of my garden, it my beds are 50 feet long. I would highly suggest that you make all the beds in your garden the same length, the same width and the same length. I have not done that because the, uh, the south end of my garden, I can grow an 80 foot chunk. So the, the north end is a 50 foot chunk and the south end is 80 foot long beds. That means that all the fabric that I use on the 80 foot long end of my garden, I have to keep consistent and keep all of those crops down there. I cannot move them back and forth. But I do that because I really like that extra 30 feet of growing space and it doesn't make sense for me to have that many more fabrics all chopped up. I hope that that makes sense to you. But if I were you and I were planning out a garden from scratch, I would do 50 foot long beds and then I would do 30, at 50 foot long beds and 30 inches wide. Okay, 
So for this year, I'm just gonna start with the north end of the garden and I'm gonna just make a square and I'm gonna make sure that it's 16 spaces wide. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, so. And I'm just gonna make it however long. I know that it's 50 feet long. This is just for visual purposes. Okay, and so this is the north end of the garden, 50 foot beds. And I'm just gonna do the same thing across the page. Okay, and same thing in the south end of my garden. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 beds wide. I'm just gonna draw a line down here and make this into a rectangle. Okay, and this is the south and of garden and these beds are 80 feet long okay so it's 130 feet all together all right i know that the first by looking this is last year's you can see that i know that the first one two three four five six beds are permanent semi-permanent for strawberries so I'm just gonna mark those off, three, four, five, six, and I'm just gonna draw a line all the way to the other end, whoops. And I'm gonna call this strawberries so that I don't plan to grow something there. Now, I planted garlic last fall. Garlic is something that you plant in the fall and you harvest it in July. And what I chose to do this time, I've put garlic on the edge of my garden a couple of times because it's easy to till around it in the spring. But last fall I chose, because I didn't wanna plant it in the same place again, I chose to put the two rows of garlic down the middle of the north and south end of the garden. So it goes the whole length. So the next two beds are garlic, and those are already planted, okay? And so then same thing with the south end. If I come over six beds, one, two, three, four, five, six, I know that these next two beds here are garlic. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark those off, and then I will know those are already planted so that I do not plan to plant something there okay all right so the rest of it is a blank slate so now to decide what to plant let me start by looking at what i planted last year i planted two 80 foot beds of sweet potatoes they grew really well it's almost march we still have some to eat but i would like to grow two 80 foot beds again, because I feel like we definitely can eat that many. And sweet potatoes keep better than any other vegetable as far as fresh. They'll keep up to a year if you cure them correctly. So I would like to grow sweet potatoes again. I know that I've grown them on this side of the garden a couple of times, and I would like to move them somewhere else. So I'm going to go back to a previous the nice thing is about having more than one of these calendars, which you would have if you buy them several years in a row, these planners. Let me see if I can find it. The nice thing is that you will have, you can look back to the companion planting and crop rotation sheets from previous years without having to flip back and forth. I mean, it's in every planner, but you don't have to flip back and forth. Okay, so... Let me see if sweet potatoes are on here. They might not be because they aren't as popular of an item. Okay, I don't see them. So I could look it up, but I think I'm just gonna go with it because we're gonna end up with, sometimes you end up with poor companions next to each other. 
and there's no way around it. It just has to do with how you have your garden spaced out. And sometimes if you are rotating crops, that sometimes that's just how it goes. So I'm going to say that we should put the sweet potatoes where we had the beans last year because potatoes are heavy feeders and the beans will have put nitrogen in the soil. So I know from looking at last year that the green beans were one, two, three, four. They were in beds five and six. So that would work out. So we would put the sweet potatoes right next to the garlic. And again, I'm doing this in pencil because sometimes you end up adjusting things. Oftentimes what I end up telling myself is that you really cannot have five rows of this or whatever. Like you, <laughs> I have to limit myself and sometimes that's a good thing. All right, so we've got the sweet potatoes done. All right, we've got cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. It worked really well to grow an 80-foot row of cabbage last year and an 80-foot row of broccoli and cauliflower. So I think I'm going to continue with that. And I may put some greens in the end of the broccoli and cauliflower row, but I think I'm going to... Yeah, I think I'm going to continue with that. So I don't wanna put them in the same place they were last year, which would be right next to where the sweet potatoes are going to be this year. I think what I'm gonna do is hop over and work on the tomatoes. The tomatoes is by far the biggest thing that we grow. So I'm going to end up, I think, putting the tomatoes where the garlic and the beets were last year. Let me check my planting sheet. Okay, tomatoes. Tomatoes are best followed by leaf, leafy things like broccoli, cabbage. Okay, so that works. So let's go ahead and do the broccoli and cabbage actually, and let's put it where the tomatoes were last year, which is gonna end up being right next to where the garlic is. Now, is garlic and cabbage, are they good? companions. Let's see. Okay, so checking my companion planting and crop rotation charts in my planner. Broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower are good companions with garlic. So that should work out. Okay, so let's go ahead and put, just for now, two beds of brassicas, basically, which is the cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, maybe some kale. Let's put that right next to the garlic. All right, last year I grew five rows of tomatoes and I was very happy with that many tomatoes. So I think I need to do five rows of tomatoes again and so if I stuck them over here where the garlic and the beets were, let me see, tomatoes. Tomatoes are best if they follow, yeah, garlic and beets. Okay, so that would work out. Okay, it doesn't always happen this easily, but over time you kind of figure out what to plant. If you're wondering how much to plant of something and you're wanting to get to where you can get all the way through the year, on your onions, for example, start by trying to figure out how many onions you think you use every day. If you cook from scratch and you have a family of seven like I do, we use at least one onion a day, sometimes two or three. So last year I planted over a thousand onions. Now we also take the extra produce from our garden to town and sell it at farmer's market. So that gives me a little bit of leeway. I know that if I grow too much, that I can probably get rid of it at farmer's market. Um, and I end up not having enough space to only, or only having enough space to grow so much, right? So that sort of limits me, which sometimes is a good thing. But start by just figuring out, like for example, spaghetti sauce, try to figure out how many times in a year you will eat spaghetti, how many quarts of sauce it takes to feed your family. It takes two quarts of spaghetti sauce to feed my family because we like to have leftovers for a second meal. So, and that's with garlic bread and corn, right? So it takes two quarts to feed my family. If it only takes you one quart to feed your family and you eat it twice a month, then you would need 
a minimum of 24 quarts of spaghetti sauce and you know you can sort of start to figure out how many tomatoes that you would want to plant right always plant more than you need the seed does not cost that much it is totally okay to put some of it in the compost pile it is not wasteful it goes to feeding the garden for the next year it's also okay to feed a few extra cucumbers to the cows right what happens in the country is you end up with cows getting in your garden once in a while sometimes the hail comes by sometimes a cutworm will come by and eat off a plant or two right and so it's always good to plant more than you think you will need having said that smaller well-tended gardens will produce more than a large out of control garden and i do not always follow my own advice very well in that area but there's a kind of a balance to find so if you're just starting out just get really good at growing tomatoes that's my number one tip for people there is nine things in my pantry that i've canned out of just tomatoes so get really good at growing tomatoes and get rid of get really good at canning those nine things and that's nine things you do not have to buy from the store that is going to make a big dent in your grocery bill okay so just start somewhere if it even if it's way smaller than this that's okay start somewhere and you will develop the muscle to do this as you go along you'll start to understand how to do it and the capacity will come to grow more things so it's a little hard for me to tell you exactly how much to plant but i can show you what we plant for our family and and you can kind of go from there something else to consider is that if you get a lot of rain and you have a really good cool year for growing you're going to have a bountiful harvest like we did last year if it's 110 degrees every day and hot and dry you probably aren't going to harvest as much as you would off those same plants in ideal growing conditions so it's always good to plant more than you think you need and on the bountiful years can and freeze more than you will need for the coming year and that way if there's hail the following year or crop failure or something else happens like the cows get in the garden then you'll still be okay you will still have food to feed your family all right so back to the task at hand so we decided five rows of tomatoes and i'm going to put them on this end one two three four five okay that's only going to leave me one row one oddball row i'm not sure that i like that but let's just see how this comes out tomatoes all right last year i did I guess I only did one row of beets. So I could put beets in there. What else do I have down here in this space? Sometimes I, I really should take some of the stuff that grows on the north end of the garden, put it in the south end of the garden, but sometimes that depends on what I need in my pantry. So I do not need as many carrots and green beans in my pantry this year as I did last year because it was such a bountiful year and we have a lot of that canned up. I will take some to farmer's market, but farmer's market can only handle so much. So I may, I'm just going to leave that bed open. I also grow cut flowers. They just bring me so much joy in the garden and on my table and on my countertops. And I also take some to farmer's market. I don't do a lot of them because I just only have the capacity to grow so much, but sometimes even a half a bed of flowers. Zinnias are really easy to grow, sunflowers, and they just make you smile and they bring a lot of pollinators to your garden too. So that's something to think about. All right, so the other things I have are green beans. I don't know if I need two 80-foot beds of green beans. That is a lot of beans. I'm going to maybe only do one bed of green beans this year. The problem with green beans is they take a lot of time to pick and a lot of time to snap and a lot of time to can. They aren't hard to can. There's nothing hard about it. It's as boring as it gets, but they take a lot of time. You really should pick your beans every other day. So that means like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're gonna be busy picking beans for three hours. That's what it did took me last year. It was three hours of picking Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I don't know if I wanna dedicate that much time to it if I don't need that many beans. 
However, I can usually sell them a lot at farmer's market, but I think for now I'm gonna maybe just say one bed of beans. Let's stick the beans. I really don't want them right next to the tomatoes. I had them next to the tomatoes last year and it was just kind of difficult. Okay, I'm just gonna say, okay, we still have beans to stick in here. And flowers and beets. Well, the beets can go somewhere else because I do not grow beets on fabric. I also do not grow carrots on fabric. What I might do this year, since I don't need as many beets or carrots, maybe I will grow half a bed of beets and a half a bed of carrots. And would it be okay if they were next to the tomatoes? I think so. Let's check our, let's check this and just see. Tomatoes are good companions with carrots. It doesn't, oh, they're poor companions with beets. Okay. So, I also kind of hate to put the flowers there because they won't get as much sun. I think I might put the flowers, two beds of flowers, clear over next to the raspberries because I've never grown flowers there and it would be a totally new place. Okay, let's try that. Two beds of flowers over next to the raspberries. Then if I did a half a bed of beets and a half a bed of carrots. Okay, half beets, half carrots. Let me see what else. So that gets rid of the beets and the carrots. I still have the green beans and I said I only wanted one row. Let's put the green beans, let's see, green beans. They are good companions with, oh, they're poor companions with beets. That's a problem. Maybe I will go ahead, I guess, and put the green beans. It doesn't say, let's see. It doesn't say if they are good, bad, good or bad companions with the green, with the tomatoes. Let's just stick them over here. Let's stick them next to the brassicas. And let's see, they would be growing where the tomatoes grew last year. So after tomatoes, it's best to plant, like what does it say, lettuce, broccoli, And then it says beans after that. I don't know, sometimes you cannot get it exact. So maybe it says that it's best if beans follow broccoli and cabbage though. And this over here would be where the broccoli and cabbage would have been last year. Okay, so I'm gonna just make a decision. You can't always have the exact combination. I'm gonna put green beans between the sweet potatoes and the beets and carrots. Even though they're not the best neighbor to the beets, that's still gonna work out probably for the best. Okay, I still have one bed that's open on this end of the garden. I'm gonna start filling up the other end and see where I come out. So we grow basil. It's one of my favorite things to grow. It is super easy to grow and you can make so much yummy stuff out of it. We make pesto and we freeze it for winter. We make pesto pasta. We make pesto pizza. You can make sourdough focaccia bread and put basil on it. I mean, basil is like my happy herb in the garden. I am gonna be growing some of my herbs in, con, in a, like a smaller container garden closer to my house, kind of like a kitchen garden. Uh, but for but the basil I grow a whole bunch of, and we actually harvest it and sell it in the grocery stores all summer. It's a really popular product for us. So I am going to definitely put the basil in the main garden again. And last year I had put the basil in a row with the spinach, lettuce, and dill. And I did that because basil, you can grow it pretty close together. And the spinach and the lettuce and the dill are all close together also. And I have a fabric, a 50 foot fabric that already has holes in it that's that, you know, fairly often. 
So it works out good to put them all together. Okay, I'm gonna put the basil, spinach, lettuce, and dill, kind of the miscellaneous herb bed, if you will, right over here next to my blueberries in my 50 foot section. So basil, spinach, lettuce, and dill. I also sold a fair amount of dill at farmer's market last year too, so that's a good thing. All right, carrots, we already did carrots down in the other end of the garden, onions. Okay, onions are a big one. I used to start my onions from seed and you can do that, but they're not gonna grow very big. So, or they aren't gonna grow probably as big as you want them to grow. So what I did last year is I ordered onion plants. They come bare root in a little bundle. It took me no time at all to plant. I think I planted a thousand onions in less than an hour. When I used to plant the onions that I started from seed, it was very tedious. And sometimes they shocked and they just, even though I started them the 1st of February, they just didn't do well. The other thing is they took up a lot of room on my plant racks where I start my seeds down in my basement. And so I purchased my onion plants last year and I grew big softball size onions, the best onions I've ever grown. All right, so this is the north end of my garden, the 50 foot beds. I ended up with one bed of basil, spinach, lettuce, and dill, two beds of onions, one bed of peppers, one bed of cucumbers, one bed of green beans, two beds of peas. The nice thing about this is the peas and the garlic will both be harvested before the tomatoes are ready to harvest. And the way this lays is then the, this will be like a path, big wide pathway, because this will all be harvested. It'll be covered in fabric. And so we'll be able to walk down here and drive our wagons down here to get to the tomatoes. See, there's the tomatoes that'll actually be right over here on the south end of the garden, okay? So this will be walkway and we'll be able to get to the tomatoes. All right, so peas, garlic, and then these are the six beds of strawberries. We also have asparagus and rhubarb and different things planted like off in this area, but that's obviously not part of this plan, but it is something that we grow. All right, down in the south end of the garden, so this will actually butt right up to this. The south end of the garden, we're gonna have one, two, three, four, five rows of tomatoes. I really didn't know what to do with this extra bed. I finally ended up just saying that I would make it like lettuce and salad mix. I really wanna get better at growing salad mix in the heat. There's lots of ways you can do it successfully. My challenge is I've never had the time to give to actually growing it, but I would like to try it. And the seed doesn't cost that much, so we'll see if I can make that work. If not, having a little extra space right here next to the tomatoes for harvesting isn't a bad thing. So if I grow lettuce early and then it doesn't end up working out when it gets really hot in the summer, just depending on what our year is like, then we'll have this area to drive the wagons down and harvest the tomatoes. These are gonna be the brassicas, so the cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower, two beds of garlic, which is already planted, two beds of sweet potatoes, one bed of green beans, and the other thing that I did is I stuck a smaller bed, a 50-foot bed of green beans down here. So they won't be in the same place, but it won't matter because that'll only be 130 foot of green beans instead of 160 foot of bed worth of green beans. You actually plant two rows per bed, but anyway. All right, and then half, half a row of beets, so 30 foot bed of beets and 30 feet of carrots. I could even do like 40 foot of beets because they sell better at farmer's market and 20 feet of carrots, but we'll just see how it goes. And then two beds of flowers. All right, so now let's jump into our online tool that's gonna help us figure out how much to seed and when to seed it. All right, I wanna show you here my favorite tool that I've used for well over 10 years to plan my garden. So it's called Seed Time. It's an online app. It is free 
to start. And then if you wanna pay the monthly membership, I think it's $13 a month, it's very inexpensive. And it will tell you on a calendar system that you can even put in your phone, it will tell you how often to plan on harvesting, when to plan on harvesting. It will tell you exactly when to seed, how much to seed, this tool is incredible and you can customize it in so many ways. So I will put a link for this down in the description box below so that you can try it for free. And then if you wanna do the monthly subscription and have it help you all through your garden season, you certainly can. All right, I'm gonna hop over here and show you mine. So I can show you last year. Let me go back to April of 2023 and you see over here on the left all of these different crops that I had chosen to grow and it lets me choose the kind of crop that I'm growing. Okay and then over here it's going to tell me all my different tasks and this might look overwhelming to you but there's some really great tutorials in this online tool that will help you navigate this and it's really not as hard as it looks. So let's just jump over to February 2024. See, this is totally blank. Now I can go in here and add all of my crops from last year, but I just want to show you if you're starting out brand new, this is just really easy. So let's hit add crop and let's say we're going to add tomatoes. Now there's two kinds of tomatoes. There's determinate. They are the ones that are more of the bush type and there's an indeterminate type. And so I'm gonna grow an indeterminate type and it's my very favorite kind and it's called Cherokee Purple. So I'm just gonna select it and you can label it if you would like. Sometimes I'll put in here exactly how many I want to seed. And if you go deeply into this tool, it will show you how close to plant your tomatoes and how many tomatoes to plan on putting in a row really, really handy. You can go down here to the advanced settings and you can change your last frost date. By the way, when you first set this tool up, you will put in your last frost date and that is what will help you determine when to plant things. And that's why this tool works whether you're down south or whether you're up north. So my last frost date is around May 15 and that is how this ends up working out. All right, so I'm gonna hit schedule. And this is going to put in tomatoes. Now you can see that it's showing when I should seed them, when I should prep the beds, when I should plan on transplanting them outside the 26th of May, when I should cultivate them, and when I can plan on harvesting my tomatoes. And this is all based on how many days on average it takes for these tomatoes to grow. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna go to add crop and I'm gonna just copy all my crops over from last year, which makes this really fast and easy because I am growing basically the same things, just in a little bit different place. I'm gonna hit copy. And it's gonna populate everything over here on the left and it's gonna fill this calendar up now. If I do not wanna see all the times that they want me to transplant and all the different things, I can go up here to task filter and I can click bed prep. Mommy. Just a minute, honey. I can click bed prep, cultivating, harvesting, and it will take those tasks off the calendar so it's not quite as messy and not as difficult to look at. Okay, so last year I grew seven different kinds of tomatoes and sometimes you have different amounts for each one of those as far as how many you wanna grow. So if I click in here, it's gonna tell me for Big Dina last year I seeded 70. Now, you wanna plan on 10 to 15% of your tomatoes or any of your seeds not germinating. You can be real particular and check the germination of each seed or look on the seed packet and it will tell you this, the germination percent. But I just usually plan on seeding 10 to 15% more than what I need because some of them don't come up or sometimes a little 
kid comes by and pulls one up or something happens to one. So it doesn't hurt to have a few extra plants. You can always share them with a friend or just toss them in the compost pile. It's not a big deal. So I always take how many I think I'm gonna need and then increase it by 10 to 15%. You also can purchase your seeds right in this tool. They allow you to shop for all of your seeds once you get it put in here by going here and it gives you a 20% discount if you are a member. So that's another really valuable thing about this tool. So if you go over here to how to in this tomato, it's gonna tell you crop settings. So it's gonna tell you how many days it's planning on for these tomatoes to mature. It's gonna tell you how to seed them. A seed one per soil block, cover the seeds with a quarter inch of peat moss. This is valuable information. If when you start to plant seeds, you don't know how to, to plant them. This is where I have learned everything that I know. And I'm gonna take you through the garden season with me and show you what I do. But if you wanna get a head start on it and kind of get an idea in your mind of how to do this, I suggest that you go to this seed time calendar. It also talks about seeding versus direct seeding. Direct seeding is something you would do with carrots in the garden that don't like to be transplanted. Tomatoes, obviously, we start ahead of time because our growing season is short enough. We want to be able to get them planted. Um, how to do it, benefits to soil blocks, how to do soil blocks. And then you can also, there's a link to some master classes that you can take. They will show you exactly how to grow and transplant each crop. So this is an absolutely fabulous course. Many, many hours of information in this course. So seed time, I will put a link to it in the description box below. And I'm gonna keep going through here and planning out my garden for 2024, figuring out exactly which varieties of each item I'm going to grow and how many I need to seed and this will automatically show me exactly when I should seed it. Now, it's gonna tell me to seed my tomatoes the 17th of March or thereabouts. My house is a constant 72 degrees all year round because we have some really great in-floor radiant heat powered by a wood boiler. Anyway, my basement stays such an even temperature and so nice and warm that my tomatoes are ready to transplant in 30 days. So for the last two years, I've actually planted them a little earlier than I should have. So I am not gonna plant my tomatoes before the 1st of April unless I do some kind of protection on them out in the garden and plan to plant them early. But typically it's best to wait to plant things like tomatoes and squash, until after your first frost because they cannot handle any frost. So I would suggest going off of what the calendar says, unless you have a greenhouse or something, and in that case, you can change these dates to be earlier. But for my experience and because of my growing conditions, I'm going to seed my tomatoes around the 1st of April. So I'm gonna be changing this calendar just a bit to seed them around the 1st of April so that I don't have them quite so big and leggy before it's time to plant them outside. So be sure to check out my seed starting video on exactly how I set up my seed starting racks and my lights in my basement. Super helpful. It's not expensive to start. Really good investment. And so anyway, I'm going to finish uh, figuring this out. I also want to tell you about my two favorite seed catalog companies. I am not an affiliate with either one of these, but I want to tell you about them. This is Berlin Seeds. They are an Amish company back in Ohio, I believe. You can order these catalogs online and then order your seeds from here. This is their 2024 catalog. I've been very, very happy with what they have. This is also where I got my onion starts is from Berlin Seeds. Also, Johnny's. Johnny's Seed is a catalog made specifically for market gardeners. So the types of seed you will see in here and the varieties that they grow are bred to produce large quantities of vegetables. So I highly recommend Johnny's Seed. This is definitely a go-to catalog for me and has been for a long time. I've only been ordering from Berlin for a couple of years, but I've been very happy with what I got from there. I got blueberry plants, elderberry plants, 
onion plants and then a bunch of seed and flower seed from Berlin. It's fun to be able to compare between the two. So if you're gonna start your own seeds, I would not suggest going to your local hardware store and just buying seed off the shelf. First of all, you don't necessarily know how old it is. And I've found that the varieties are not always suited for where you live. Some of them also do not produce as well or are not as disease resistant as some of these that you will get from the higher quality catalogs. So if you're gonna take the time and spend the effort to start your own seeds, then I highly suggest investing in some really good quality seed. So be sure to check out my seed starting video and find out how I have my lights and my racks set up in my basement to grow all of my seeds on. Also be sure to check out our blog, wagonwheelhomestead.com for a list of the varieties of vegetables and fruit that we will be growing in our 2024 garden. Thanks for coming along with me today as we teach you the skills you will need to grow a simple, sustainable life. Bye-bye.